with my years on the bench, I rendered virtually hundreds of decisions. But several recent rulings leading to acquittals have attracted much criticism. Even claims that international criminal justice has failed. Nothing, nothing is further from the truth. But before explaining to you why this is so, I would like briefly to sketch to you the contours of international criminal justice and explain and tell you how I came to find myself on the bench. As you all know, atrocities are not new, unfortunately, are not new to human history. <coughs> but it was only after the massive atrocities of World War II that an international criminal tribunal was established in Nuremberg by the victorious powers. Its mission was to try crimes against humanity and war crimes. 22 leading Nazis were in the dock. Seven were given prison sentences. 12 were sentenced to hang. And three were acquitted. Trials were also held in Tokyo for Japanese war crimes. After World War II, for half a century, there were no international tribunals. There were no international trials. But the atrocities committed during the Yugoslav wars in the 90s and the genocide committed in Rwanda in 1994 led the United Nations to the establishment of war crimes tribunals, one for former Yugoslavia and one for Rwanda. In 1993 and in 1994, respectively. Other tribunals followed. And then in 1998, uh, uh, the first permanent criminal tribunal, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, was established, agreed upon in Rome. International criminal justice, after half a century, had come alive. In 1946, when Nuremberg was ongoing, I have hardly heard of Nuremberg, but my life was formed and inevitably altered by the Second World War. I was nine when Nazi Germany invaded Poland, the country of my birth. Overnight, we became refugees. I survived in ghettos, hiding in lofts and cellars, and eventually, was put in a forced labor camp. I was 15 when the war ended, with most of my family killed by the Nazis because they were Jews. I emerged from the war lucky to be alive, with too many painful memories, no education, and the hunger for school and normality. But an opportunity arose to leave for Palestine, where I had relatives. And my, those relatives enrolled me in a high school. And my goal, which was not easy, was to catch up with my education, despite tremendous gaps in that education. The deprivations of World War II turned my craving for education into an obsession. And education opened the door to all that followed. The imprint of war made me interested in work that might contribute to making atrocities less possible in the future and reduce the danger of violence, chaos, and loss of autonomy, which I remembered so well. I chose law, international law, and after the universities of Jerusalem, Harvard, and Cambridge, uh, chose a career in Israeli foreign ministry. Right after the Six-Day War, I was appointed legal advisor of the ministry. A baptism of fire came very soon thereafter with a request from the Prime Minister of Israel for a legal opinion as to the legality of the establishment under international law of settlements on the West Bank, in Gaza, and in the Golan Heights. I wrote to the Prime Minister that such settlements would violate the Forged Geneva Convention 
as well as the property rights of Arab inhabitants of Palestine. My opinion was not accepted, as you all know, and the wave of settlements followed, making the achievement of peace in the future so much more difficult. Of course, I knew that this was not the opinion that the Prime Minister would have wanted. But I am convinced that legal advisors must be faithful to the law. I have never regretted that opinion. In 1977, I resigned from the ministry and immigrated to the United States, starting a new life as a professor of international law at NYU and a citizen of the United States. I taught human rights, international humanitarian law, and law of war. In 1998, I had the great honor of serving on the US delegation to the Rome Conference, which established the International Criminal Court. In 2001, I was elected by the United Nations General Assembly a judge in the tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. So, at the very young age of 71, I found myself uh, starting a new career as an international judge. Although my career has uh, followed a circuitous path, the constant theme has been efforts to grapple with the chaos and the pain of war. War shattered my childhood, gave me a craving for education and a desire to use the law to bring an end to atrocities. War led to my legal opinion against the settlements. As professor, I taught the law of war. Interest in the origins of the law of war and the law of chivalry led me to an abiding fascination with Shakespeare's historical plays. Now, as a judge, I hear appeals concerning atrocities committed in time of armed conflict. International criminal courts are, in many ways, like criminal courts in domestic jurisdictions. They weigh evidence. They follow due process of law. They abide by law and human rights. But international criminal courts and their cases are also extraordinary because of the tremendous breadth and massive scale of alleged crimes committed over long periods and across many localities, because of the enormous body of evidence, because of lack of an independent police force to help obtain and seize evidence, because of utter dependence on cooperation of sovereign states, which is not always available because some cases have a political dimension, not least because they involve top civilian and military leaders. Because of their unique role, international criminal courts are also often seen as something much more than just criminal courts. Judgments are expected to be definitive histories of the conflict. Judgments are expected to foster reconciliation between and among parties to the conflict. Judgments are expected to bring victims closure through convictions. Often, victims and members of the public equate bringing senior leaders to justice with the entering of convictions. Thus, the accused sometimes come before international courts with a narrative of guilt. Of course, judgments may well produce some such results, but this is not their judicial mission, nor is it a yardstick for measuring their success. A, there is the rap, as Shakespeare wrote. Different stakeholders have different visions of international criminal justice. For judges, Bringing someone to justice means trying the person charged fairly, soberly, in accordance with the law and evidence, and respecting the time-honored presumption 
of innocence. This is what the rule of law requires on a domestic level, and it requires no less on the international level. Nevertheless, as I have mentioned, several judgments of acquittal have led to claims that international justice is failing. Nothing is, of course, further from the truth. We all recognize that both in domestic and international systems, acquittals br bring victims real pain and cause controversy. In the international system, given the dimension of the crimes and the political aspects, this controversy is, of course, magnified. It might be seen as a denial of what happened to the victims, or even the whole community, and of their hopes and expectations. Others see acquittals as rewriting the history of the conflict and as a failure to promote reconciliation. In my view, true failure of international justice would be if judges were to convict without adequate evidentiary and legal basis, where the law or the evidence do not support the finding that the person is guilty beyond reasonable doubt, it is the duty of any judge. It is the duty of all international judges. It is my duty to rule accordingly. In so doing, judges do not declare that the person charged is innocent. They do not redefine history. They simply follow the dictates of the law, no more and no less. Judges must be blind to outside sentiments, to broader agendas, to pre-existing narratives of innocence or guilt, and even to their own personal life experience. It is a sign, I suggest, of a mature and independent legal system that judges are focused on the narrow mandate given to them, which is to try those charged with crimes fairly and in accordance with the law. Judges should not and do not try to satisfy the expectations, often conflicting, of the victims, prosecutors, commentators, civil society, and the broader public. Some recent criticism suggests, however, the importance of strengthening the rule of law through education and outreach. Establishing respect for the rule of law is critically important in ensuring freedoms, human rights, and an orderly society. In all societies, the rule of law requires that we accept not only those decisions of courts with which we agree, but also those with which we disagree. An a la carte approach to accepting judgments is a denial of the very foundations of the rule of law. In doing my work as a judge, in a principled way, come what may in terms of criticism, I am helping to strengthen the integrity of international criminal justice. And in years to come, I trust that others will see the first few decades of international criminal justice as a time when fledgling courts made profoundly important contributions to ending impunity and upholding human rights and human dignity. So as you see, my life has come a full circle. From World War II to trying war crimes and doing it justly and fairly. Looking back at my life, Difficult as it may have been at times, I find comfort in the fact that throughout I have tried to stay on a moral course, wherever the winds may have been blowing. And I find comfort that, come what may by way of challenges and criticism, international justice too has stayed and will stay its course. And I thank you.